morning. Welcome to our message today, which is the 11th in our series, The Acts of the Holy Spirit. And today the title of the message is Confidence in Christ. Confidence in Christ. We're going to read together from Acts chapter 26. I'm going to read some selected verses there and then going on further in the message, we will read some other verses from the passage. So Acts chapter 26, we're going to read first of all, Verses 27 to 29. And Paul is asking here in the midst of uh, this hearing. He is saying, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Acts 26, verses 27 to 29. Now, insecurity, insecurity is a crippling condition. Yes, it is a pandemic which has spread throughout all sectors of our society. And this pandemic of insecurity affects Christians as well. Our own insecurity as believers keeps us from living a full and free Christian life. Because we doubt our own worth before God, we are willing to be content to live a passive Christian walk. Because we lack confidence, we also lack the aggressive boldness which we need in order to have an impact on the world for Christ. Living biblical Christianity in a secular world is one of the themes for these messages from the book of Acts. It is also the challenge which every Christian faces on a daily basis as we seek to be the kind of man or woman that God wants us to be. We struggle with the claims of Christ on our lives and are constantly challenged to be more effective in our Christian walk and witness. Sometimes our own fears, doubts and insecurities get in the way of what we desire to do for Christ. How can you be all that you desire to be for Christ when you see so many areas of lack in your own life? Is it possible to be the kind of Christian witness you need to be when you are still struggling with things in your own life? Now it is true that you can't give what you don't have. But it is also true that our perception of ourselves is not always accurate. Our insecurities arise largely because we haven't seen by faith and accepted by faith God's own word concerning us. There's a desperate need in the church for believers to know who they are in Christ. We need to understand God's opinion of us. We need by faith to come to know what we have received in Christ. We need to accept the extent of his forgiveness and acceptance of us. Now our text today speaks of one who was far from perfect, but who lived in the confidence of his position in Christ. As we look at Paul's appearance before King Agrippa, We will not only come to understand his motivation to see people come to Christ, but we will also catch a vision of who we are in Christ that will give us the same kind of confident assurance which he had. This episode in Paul's life finds him imprisoned in Caesarea. Because of a near riot in Jerusalem and a plot by the Jews to kill him, Roman officers had brought him to Felix, the governor, so that his guilt or innocence could be ascertained. Paul remained in prison under Felix for two years, at which time Festus succeeded Felix as governor. During this time, Paul preached the gospel to both Felix and Festus, but neither one of them could decide what to do with Paul. They both knew that he was innocent. Yet they wanted to please the Jews who wanted Paul in jail. They were in a political dilemma. 
Should truth prevail over political expediency? It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Should truth prevail over political expediency? So King Agrippa arrived to pay a visit to Festus. King Agrippa was the great-grandson of Herod the Great, who had murdered all the male children in the vicinity of Bethlehem because he feared the birth of Jesus. So let's come into the scene now. And the first thing we're going to notice in the scene is an aggressive believer. An aggressive believer. You see, everywhere Paul went and to everyone he met, he gave a witness of the grace of God and of their need to come to Christ for salvation. And this meeting with Agrippa was certainly no exception. Picture with me what must have happened. We read in the word of God, the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. That's Acts 25, verse 23. Great ceremony surrounded this official occasion. Festus was wearing his scarlet governor's robe for the occasion. King Agrippa and Bernice were also arrayed in the splendor of their royal robes. The court was majestically decorated for the occasion. The captains, centurions and legionnaires stood in splendor as they lined the great hall of audience to remind all of the military might of Rome. The honored guests and dignitaries looked on to witness the questioning of Agrippa. Now into this magnificent hall, before these imposing earthly powers, is brought Paul. He is a man small in stature, physically unimposing. The chains of his imprisonment dangle from his wrists. He wore no royal robe, but rather the robes of a prisoner. Yet within this little Jewish man is a power unmatched by all the regalia which surrounds him. As you look into his eyes, you see a majestic confidence and a depth of understanding. When Paul speaks, his voice cuts through the pretentious elegance of this glorious display of pomp. And what he says rings with truth and is clothed in power. Paul begins to make his defense before Agrippa. It is as much a testimony to the gospel of the grace of God as it is a defense of his innocence. You see, Paul was neither impressed by Agrippa nor afraid of the Roman power. Paul's motivating desire was to see people come to know Christ. He was determined to use every opportunity to see that happen. And there's a message here. For all of us, we see that Paul seized the opportunity to share Christ with Agrippa. This should encourage us to do the same. Whatever the circumstances of our encounters with other people, they are opportunities to share the good news of the grace of God. When people encounter us, they also encounter Christ's ambassadors. Remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul saw himself as an ambassador for Christ, and so should we. We stand before this watching world in the place of Christ urging all those who do not know Christ to be reconciled to God. We must use every opportunity. It is the message that we must share with every person, regardless of their place in society. Paul preached to the poor. He preached to the Gentiles and the Jew alike. He preached to the affluent and the socially important. You see, Paul could stand before paupers and kings. It didn't matter to him. A man is a man, regardless of his title. And without Christ, he is lost. Sometimes the temptation 
is to draw back from sharing with the so-called VIPs. In our insecurity, sometimes we do draw back. And what we need to do is to catch the confidence of Paul. We need to see ourselves as ambassadors for Christ. We stand in His authority and by His command. We need not fear any man. An aggressive believer. The second thing we see is an anxious king. An anxious king. What was the effect of Paul's witness to Agrippa? As Paul preached about the truth of salvation by faith in the risen Jesus. King Agrippa was getting more nervous. Agrippa knew of these things. And Paul's testimony has the ring of truth about it. You see, truth produces conviction. Perhaps Festus noticed Agrippa's uneasiness. And when Paul's message was being driven home, Festus intervened. And we read further in the word of God. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Acts 26 verse 24. But Paul would not be turned aside. Still standing before Agrippa, we read, he replied to Festus, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. Paul replied, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. That's verses 25 and 26. Then Paul delivers a call for decision. He says to the king, now in verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Paul was calling for Agrippa to make a decision. You see, friends, truth demands a decision. Agrippa had already experienced the conviction of truth. And now he must do something. Agrippa decides to take the course of evasion. We read in verse 28. Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? The thrust of Agrippa's statement was that Paul shouldn't expect Agrippa to make such a decision on the spur of the moment. The fact is that Agrippa was uncomfortable. He had heard the truth and somehow he knew it to be true. He was feeling the pressure. Perhaps deep down within him, faith was attempting to be born, but he quickly aborted that attempt. You see, friends, not everyone is willing to hear the truth. You will witness to people who profess themselves to be open-minded, thoughtful intellectuals but who are opposed to the truth. They will not admit it. Many times they will try to evade the truth by refusing to admit that it is the truth. They do not want to admit that they are rejecting truth that would show them as being not so clever after all. The real reason they reject the truth is not so much for intellectual reasons, but it is for moral reasons. There is no other explanation for why intelligent people would reject truth. It is the utter moral depravity of humankind. We are addicted to selfish pleasures and we do not desire to change. This was the situation with King Agrippa, which brings us thirdly to what I call an amazing declaration. An amazing declaration. We read there that Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. That's verse 29. What I find amazing is not only Paul's desire to see the king be saved, but the way Paul expressed that desire. He said that he desired that the king and everyone else may become what I am. Now on the surface, That seems to be like reckless arrogance on the part of Paul. Did Paul really think that he was such a great person that they should desire to be like him? Why didn't he say they should become like Christ? What does Paul's statement say about his own self-worth? 
What does it say about his view of himself as a sinner who has been forgiven? What does it tell us about Paul's view of the grace of God working in his life? You see, Paul certainly knew his shortcomings. He knew his faults. He was aware of his sins. On several occasions, he reminds us of just how great a sinner he was before his conversion to Christ. Paul had persecuted the church. Many in the early church suffered and even died. Paul called himself on one occasion the chief of sinners. He was fully aware of his own sinful past, but he was aware of something else as well. At just the right time in Paul's life, Jesus Christ had come to him. He had been encountered by the grace of God and with his face to the ground, he had received Christ as his Savior and Lord. And all of those horrible sins he had committed were forgiven. His heart was cleansed. He was set free. See, Paul had come to understand the complete forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He himself wrote about us that we are accepted in the beloved. This sinful man had come to understand that even when Christ receives you, he says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, this is perhaps one of the hardest lessons to learn in the Christian life. I know intellectually about the forgiveness of Christ. I know what the scripture says in 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. While I know that Christ has forgiven my sins, sometimes I find it extremely hard to accept the fact that I'm forgiven. I suppose we all find it hard to forgive ourselves, to really believe that we're accepted by Christ. And therein lies our insecurity and our lack of confidence. Paul wished that all those who heard him that day may become, he says, what I am, except for these chains. Paul was saying, this is my only exception. I would like for all of you just to be like I am, except for these chains. Now, all of us have those exceptions, don't we? Those things that we carry like heavy baggage through a busy airport. And by the time we get to where we're supposed to be, we're exhausted. These exceptions are burdens too heavy to bear. But in Christ, the exceptions can disappear. In Christ, we can be made whole. In Christ, we can find a confidence for daily living. For we find acceptance as his children. Somebody said our insecurity flows from the fact that we live in the exceptions rather than the acceptance. Of Christ. Our insecurity flows from the fact that we live in the exceptions rather than in the acceptance of Christ. It's hard to forgive yourself, but you must, for Christ has already forgiven you. And you are now a new person in Christ. You can begin again. That's what the grace of God is all about. God knew what he was doing when he chose you. He knows all about your sins, all the weaknesses, and he called you while you were yet in your sin. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And remember now that you are his workmanship. He will see you through by his grace. If we would ever meet the challenge of living biblical Christianity in a secular world, we must begin to see ourselves from Christ's perspective. We are forgiven, cleansed, redeemed by his blood. God sees us now through the finished work of Christ. We are kings and priests in the kingdom of God. No matter what our outward circumstances, we can hold our heads high. We never have to be ashamed of the gospel. We can proclaim it boldly, seizing every opportunity to share it with every person everywhere. The same confidence which we see in Paul 
can be our confidence. Why? Because the same God is our God. The same God is our God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Father, Father, thank you so much that you are with us. And Lord, if you are with us, who can be against us? Oh God, we stand today, not proudly, but humbly. We stand in the victory that is ours in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now that as we part from one another, that the love of God our Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit, our Counselor and our Comforter, will go with us and be with us and keep us both now and forever. In Jesus' name, Amen. Goodbye. God bless you. God keep you. I look forward to seeing you soon. Amen. Amen.